So I'm very honored to be here to be part of the African Drone Forum and be able to moderate this, uh, this very special panel on Africa's uh, drone economy. This brings together a very nice set of people uh, from government, from aviation regulators, industry, and uh, academia and innovators. Um, I sit here today with four speakers, four panel members. Um, Honorable uh, Minister Paula Ingabire, Minister of ICT and Innovation from Rwanda. Please come to the, to the podium. <laughs> we have uh, Mrs. Uh, no, Miss Leslie Carey, Chief Remotely Piloted Aircraft Systems in, from the International Civil Aviation o Organization, IKEA. IKEA. Thank you. And we have Mr. Uh, Yong Kim, President of Korea Institute of Aviation Safety and Technology. Welcome. <laughs> and last but not least, uh, Ms. Temi Giva, CEO of LifeBank from Nigeria. Thank you. <laughs> so, drones are a big opportunity for Africa. And Africa, I think, is leading the rest of the world in drone applications. There's a clear opportunity to integrate drones into the mobility ecosystem and make them part of the solution to the infrastructure deficit faced in many areas of the continent. So it's a wonderful, I think, a wonderful opportunity to rethink infrastructure and transport services for a new kind of supply chains with, with a much greater reach, a much greater impact on resilience and climate change, and a much potentially lower cost kind of solution. Targeting needs and, and challenges that we cannot meet right now through traditional modes of transport. So we're getting closer and closer to mainstreaming the drones, but a lot of work needs to be done. And just mentioned the regulatory framework needs to be in place, for instance but also policies, investments, and uh, of course, the private sector. It's not just the government can do the trick. The private sector needs to step in and get the opportunity to do so. So let's focus on that area. So my, my key takeaway is actually that drones are not just for the develop, uh, developed world, for the rich countries. It's not just a gimmick or a gadget. We all are a bit of a geek, but or we should get out of that kind of geek kind of attitude. That's very nice, but this is, can have a real purpose and can have a kind of opportunity, a leapfrogging opportunity for African uh, people and countries. So we want to hear from our panelists some reactions on some high-level thoughts for this uh, audience, a very interested audience, that will help set the tone for the forum. So I will give first three to five minutes to each and every panel member, so you can express your feelings. And then we have a round of Q&A, one or two questions, and I hope we have some time for Q&A from the audience. But we are running quickly out of time, I understand that, because we have a guest of honor that will uh, meet us uh, soon. Uh, we'll start with Honorable Minister Paula Ingeberi, Minister of ICT and Innovation of Rwanda. She's well known in Rwanda, of course, as a technology enthusiast uh, who currently serves as the Minister of ICT and Innovation in the Government of Rwanda. Before her current appointment, she was head of the Kigali Innovation City Initiative and the former head of ICT at the Rwanda Development Board. She's part of the Girls in ICT Rwanda and has also been at the helm of Transform Africa, a platform that brings together innovators and policymakers across Africa to shape Africa's digital transformation agenda. Uh, and she was a systems design and management fellow at MIT at uh, Boston. Thank you. The floor is yours for three to five minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think starting off from what you um, earlier said around uh, drones having the potential not just to create impact um, in the developed world, but also the ability to create impact in the developing world is, is very true. And very particularly because we're talking about unmanned aerial vehicles, we 
have over the last few years seen um, so many use cases that are creating uh, impact within different communities and largely the kind of um, social impact activities that are happening in Africa. Um, if you look at some of the examples, let's take South Sudan that has been uh, facing uh, problems around desertification and you have two entrepreneurs that have come together and decided to use uh, drones uh, to plant acacia trees that are going to tackle the issue of uh, soil erosion. Then you go to Malawi that is looking at putting in place um, a drone academy and also a test corridor for some of the work that is being done. And also here at home in Rwanda where we are using drones to respond to um, an eminent healthcare issue which is around making sure emergency delivery of healthcare products is, is made possible in the most efficient um, uh, manner. But that also goes to say that even for Africa as a continent, what we're looking at is not just to look at unmanned aerial vehicles as a cool technology to really implement, but tying it to what are some of those infrastructure gaps that we have on the continent, and what are those potential technologies that are going to help address uh, some of these uh, issues that we're dealing with. And that's why you see a lot of these success stories happening because they're really coming in to respond to an actual need in, very, in specific communities and then leveraging um, the potential of the drone uh, technologies. The other thing, of course, uh, that is very important for us to discuss and we'll get into details um, as we go through the Q&A is for you to be able to put in place a thriving drone ecosystem there is regulations and policies. Mm -hmm. Now, this being an emerging technology, we couldn't have assumed that there was certain, uh, you know, a certain standard of regulations that were in place. And what that meant was for us to be able to create relevant regulations and policies, there has to be some use cases that we're really uh, testing the viability of these regulations and policies. The other thing that we need to start looking into going forward now that we've seen the viability, the success stories that have come with using unmanned aerial vehicles is to start to think about privacy because that is a major concern around all these drones that are flying around with sensors and cameras. What kind of data are they collecting? And where is this data going? And where is it hosted? What is it being used for? And so, so these are some of the issues, uh, again, that once they start to surface, they also uh, play a very critical role in how we design and, and reinvent some of the regulations and policies that we have in place. Okay. Thank you. Let's, let's go to the next uh, speaker, panelist, uh, uh, Les Leslie Carey. Uh, let me introduce you quickly, and then you can introduce yourself as well uh, as you fit. Les Leslie is the chief of the remotely piloted aircraft system uh, section in the uh, Air Navigation Bureau at the uh, ICAO brings more than 30 years of experience in aviation to this panel. She started her career as a traffic, air traffic controller, so she real experience. <laughs> and back in 2007, her management at AKO told her, go out there and figure out unmanned aircraft systems in 2007. She has been leading this work in AKO ever since, so from the day one, basically. <laughs> Thank you, welcome. All right, thank you, and good morning, everybody. I'm really delighted to be here participating in the African Drone Forum, but I do have to say that for this morning's session in particular, I'm really here on behalf of the Secretary General of ICAO, Dr. Fang Liu. She was unable to attend, but she sent, sends her regards and very best wishes for a successful event and clearly that is going to be happening. So for those of you that are unfamiliar with ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization, it is a specialized agency within the United Nations system that sets conventions, policies, and standards for international civil aviation. It has been doing so for 75 years and has 193 member states. Now the standards that we adopt in Montreal are actually, they form the basis for national regulations of countries all over the world. Now, unmanned aircraft are transforming the aviation industry at a phenomenal pace. And the traditional aviation stakeholders, particularly the regulators, are having 
they're, they're being challenged by how to respond to this very fast-moving new entity. Now, unmanned aircraft will support all sorts of new types of businesses, from goods delivery to inspections and monitoring, medical logistics, precision agriculture, filming, science, police and fire, environmental studies. The possibilities for work being done by these new aircraft are really awe-inspiring, the different types of potentials that they will bring, as well as the economic benefits. Now, unmanned aircraft also contribute to the sustainable development goals by introducing new jobs, enhancing agricultural productivity, saving lives through delivery of medicines, food, and other goods. They're used for defining and maintaining property rights through surveillance and mapping, to list just a few. Additionally, networks of electric powered lift aircraft that take off and land vertically will enable rapid and reliable transportation between suburbs and cities, as well as within cities. The use of such aircraft can generate significant savings in commute time and therefore positively contribute to urban mobility. Now on the surface, each of these points are new and different from traditional aviation. However, the fundamentals underneath are the same. We expect the aircraft to operate as intended. They're expected not to crash. We expect minimal disruption to people that are not involved or participating in the operation. We expect the system to pay for itself rather than the public having to pay for it. Now this brings me to the challenges that must be overcome in order for these promising technologies to be safely and securely deployed. Firstly, we need globally harmonized provisions for unmanned aviation. ICAO's work in this regard helps focus research and development activities for required technologies and for certification methods. Secondly, the increasing numbers of aircraft, whether manned or unmanned, plan to operate at low level simultaneously within urban and non-urban areas will require new approaches to air traffic management, development of a framework for UAS traffic management, commonly referred to as UTM, is well underway. Thirdly, regarding physical infrastructure, among many policy questions which need to be addressed is the identification, allocation, and recovery of costs for the development and deployment of said infrastructure. Fourthly, in addition to the key prerequisites of safety and security, acceptance of these technologies by regulators and by the public at large will require creative and collaborative solutions for other concerns, such as noise, privacy, and data protection, some of which will need to be developed on a national or local basis. Now, these are a few of the challenges that need to be overcome. On a positive note, each is being addressed, and here in Africa, the enthusiasm and the determination to succeed in this new arena is clear to see. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's, let's go through our third panelist, uh, Mr. Yong Kim. Um, He's president of the Korea Institute of uh, Aviation Safety and Technology. Uh, he worked previously as vice president of the Korea Transport Institute, COTI, well-known partner of the World Bank, very much appreciated. Uh, as a ch analyst, chief of air team at uh, the ITF OCD Transport Research Institute. Uh, he was a professor at the Korea Aerospace University and he holds a doctor degree in transportation engineering at the University of Maryland at College Park. Thank you very much. Thank you, moderator. Uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, distinguished delegate. Uh, I'm very honored and uh, grateful uh, for having the opportunity to speak before you 
uh, being invited to today's opening and plenary of the ADF. Uh, I am Yeon Myung Kim, uh, President of the KIAST, Korea Institute of Aviation Safety Technology. KIAST is a public institution under Korea's Ministry of Land, Infrastructure, and Transport. Uh, it's a, yeah, KIAST is kind of some like a think tank of the government. Thereby, uh, KIAST was established to contribute in the security of aviation safety and uh, industry development through specializing in aircraft certification, aircraft accident prevention related to certification or testing research and uh, R&D. As part of the job, in accordance with the Aviation Business Act, and drone promotion related laws. We support various drone related policy enforcement through fostering and supporting outstanding drone companies, establishment and operation of drone infrastructure and uh, testing facilities, and drone uh, research. Uh, in Korea, the government of dimly, uh, uh, the government is deeply involved in all level of drone related policy establishment, enforcement, and the feedback. As such a strong commitment to fostering the drone industry, we are making various efforts, including to always listen to the uh, industry's opinion and examine the direction of policy implementation together. For development of the uh, drone industry, we are well aware that uh, rather depending on the private sector effort in, in the public sector, such as environmental provision, holds much importance. We see the potential of drone utilization business in Africa greater than anywhere else. Drone business that have already been stabilized through demonstration in Korea, such as delivery of good, land survey, forest fire detection, and disaster site deployment, will be able to Im immediately operate and play its uh, part in Africa. Also, by sharing our accumulated know-how, we may contribute to establishing drone policy in Africa. Uh, that's why uh, more than 50 Korean delegates joined this uh, forum, and uh, many of our uh, startup company uh, shows their uh, some product in, in the uh, exhibition booth. Mm. So please join the uh, Korean uh, exhibition booth. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kim. Thank you. So our last panelist, uh, Tammy uh, Giba, the founder and CEO of LifeBank. Uh, interesting fact. In 2014, the BBC listed her as one of the 100 women changing the world. Very, very unique. Thank you. Very pretty. Very good. She was also recognized as an African innovator by Quartz and the World Economic Forum. As head of LifeBank, her goal is to save a million lives in 10 years by providing access to essential healthcare products to hospitals across the continent. She has over 10 years of health management ex experience with the uh, Department of, uh, for Inter International Development, DFID, World Health Organization, UNDP, and the Lagos State Government. Um, interesting fact already is that uh, they have saved already more than 6,000 lives. Uh, I want to quote Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook, not my not a real fan of Mark Zuckerberg, <laughs> but in this case he's absolutely right. If everyone had an opportunity to build some, something like LifeBank, then the world would be a better place. Over to you. I think you have a video. Uh, you want to start with the video? I think. Yes. Can we start the video first? Hello, thank you for calling Life Bank. My name is Dr. Lafay. How may I please start? Hello, good afternoon. This is Dr. George from Apostolic Medical Center. 
Nigeria has one of the highest maternal mortality rates in the world, and this is mainly attributed to postpartum hemorrhage. Every hour, 10 African women bleed to death because their hospital cannot find the critical supplies they need to stay alive. And 90% of them can be saved with easy access to these supplies, particularly blood. I started this movement to attempt to rescue women across Africa. LifeBank is a medical distribution company. We like to call our system the four Ds. Data, discovery, delivery, and donors. First, we gather inventory information using our BankX system. Then, we help hospitals find what they need using three methods. First, they can call into our call center, they can use our USSD platform, or our LabEx, which is a kiosk in the hospital. Then we deliver using three methods. We can deliver via road using motorcycles. We can deliver on the water using boats. And we deliver in the air using drones. We deliver these supplies in the right condition and on time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We are in the business of saving lives. We are building a movement of one million blood donors that will finally solve blood shortage across our communities. We are committed to innovating within the supply chain. First, we build a smart bag that brings transparency and accountability into the blood system. It's a blockchain technology that ensures the safety of the critical supplies we distribute. It gives hospitals access to all the details about the donation. Then we built a boat that brings universal access to critical supplies for everybody. It allows the poorest people to have access to the critical supplies they need to survive. We charge $10 for every unit of products we move and we have delivered over 19,000 units and counting. We have grown by 3x every single year since we've launched, showing that we're building something special and we have the best chance of solving this problem across emerging economies. This problem exists all over the world. It is so important that we solve this problem once and for all. Thank you. Over to you. <laughs> Thank you so much. I thought the video could do a much better job <laughs> than, than me uh, trying to explain all of that. So uh, we've really mastered um, the delivery of these critical supplies in developing countries. We've, we've been able to master uh, ground operation using motorcycles, on the water, using boats, and even light trucks um, across developing countries. Um, but, you know, we, we've been able to deliver, you know, on average 45 minutes. So from the time the hospital calls in and says, we need blood, we need oxygen. We're able to deliver in 45 minutes. We're very proud of that data, and we've been around for only four years, and we've done so much. However, there's some patients who don't have 45 minutes uh, for our ground operations. Um, for postpartum hemorrhage, for example, which I, uh, was shown on the video, postpartum hemorrhage can kill a woman, a perfectly healthy woman who's delivering a baby, between 20 minutes and two hours. So there are some patients who simply don't have the 45 minutes for us. Data science is critical. We are building a platform that we're calling SkyBank that would really use uh, data to make predictions for patients who actually don't have that 45 minutes that a ground operation can solve. So SkyBank will allow us to actually get ahead of it and get the drone set up and on its way, even before the patient starts crashing. Cost effectiveness is critical. We believe that if we're delivering and doing this work in, in developing countries, in countries where, um, you know, still developing, still figuring their economy, emerging economies, uh, that we must pay attention to the cost. Effectiveness is critical. Saving lives is important. But if there is an alternative, um, we may want to use that alternative. And if the only way to save a patient's life is using drones, those are the, way, those are the times we want to use this technology. 
And finally, profitability is key. We're a business. Um, we, we, we care about what we do, of course, but for us to actually help people, for us to build sustainability into our business, we must be profitable. And we must do this drone mm -hmm. delivery in a way that is profitable. Mm -hmm. So we are looking at how do we, what are the innovations? What, do we, what must we do? Should we manufacture locally? Uh, should we, you know, what are, what are the, how do we bring out uh, battery technology so that we can do multiple delivery on one trip? Uh, so there's so many things we are thinking out about how to bring profitability into this you know, distribution system, uh, particularly using this tool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very inspiring. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We'll come back to you. Uh, it is very important to have the private sector involved in, in here. Uh, success will depend on, on you guys. Uh, of course, on the government as well. That's, that's a step to Rwanda, for instance, for the enabling environment. So a few questions. Uh, Honourable Minister, um, so Rwanda has become a kind of leader in, in this area, so how, how did that happen? And you have a strategy in place, an ICT strategy, which covers a lot of things like blockchain, artificial intelligence, drones, airspace technologies. How does that look like? There's a very bold vision. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? And, and how do you see the future of the drone economy uh, in Rwanda, but also on the continent? questions <laughs> for for us for a start uh, let's talk about what our vision is uh, as a country to become a tech hub and what that really means is um, being able to put in place the right kind of environment where you can attract all kinds of innovators and entrepreneurs to come and thrive within the economy but for that to be done and for you to have that conducive environment we had to work with different institutions uh, to think about what does it take uh, to make it easy to start and scale a business in Rwanda. But now, because we're particular, particularly talking about being an innovation tech hub, we then have to think what kind of openness should we have as a government, as a community, as an industry, as an ecosystem, mm. to, to really um, embrace change and create uh, a platform for uh, emerging technologies. And a lot of this is also enshrined in what we, what we have as our proof of concept strategy, which um, in essence what it means is, yes, there are all these emerging technologies. How can we uh, embrace them and how can we use them in a manner that responds to the challenges that we are all uh, grappling with? And the way our proof of concept strategy is structured is not around technologies. It's around where do we want to see the most productivity, efficiency gains. And so we looked at those kind of industries where not just for Rwanda, but for the rest of the continent, we can create uh, that proof of concept that can be scaled uh, elsewhere. So what we did was uh, through a very deep dive analysis was to sort of narrow down, because uh, if you want to be a proof of concept, it can't be in everything. You have to start somewhere, create the success stories, mm -hmm. uh, document some of the lessons learned, uh, and then be able to find ways of, is, are these models replicable in the other industries and areas? So a proof of concept um, focuses on three areas. We have uh, agri-tech, looking at how we can use uh, emerging and digital technologies to increase agricultural productivity for Rwanda and for the rest of the continent, but also looking at the entire supply chain, the entire value chain, and understanding where can technology play a role in increasing the productivity, but also giving you the efficiency gains that you're looking for. The other thing that we focus, uh, the other area of focus is healthcare, digital healthcare, understanding how do we improve, one, access to healthcare, but also eventually what technologies can help us to increase the quality of healthcare that is provided uh, across the continent. And the third bit, of course, is uh, FinTech, which is really around financial inclusion. And for us, those were very critical industries to focus on as a start because they gave you the ability to improve lives directly for the citizens, but at the same time, making sure that they're financially empowered to be able to create new business models. Now, when we started off with, the, with drones and understanding what did we need to create one, the right regulations and policies, the best way to do it was to understand, can we have some use cases that can be tested, that can be used as we uh, you know, design these use cases to inform the policies and regulations that we put in place? 
And that goes to say that it wasn't even a single institution effort. It required that there's that coordinated approach that happens across the different government agencies, mm -hmm. whether it's mm -hmm. the Civil Aviation Authority, whether it's the specific ministries where we were creating use case applications uh, for using drones and other emerging technologies, and also looking at the industry players. But the beauty about all this is that in using drones, for example, to deliver blood to our rural hospitals, we were able to create an aerial network um, of um, logistics network of, of drones, one that can not just serve the healthcare industry, but that is multi-purpose and is used to really be a catalyst for other parts of yeah. the economy. Now, your question, which was around uh, what, you know, what are we doing to support the vision of drones and everything that we're doing, it's important to understand that even when we had zipline, which is really when everyone talks about drones and is talking about Rwanda, the first thing that they'll think about is zipline and the kind of impact it's created. You know, bringing down uh, delivery of blood uh, and medical products from you know uh, three hours to about 26 minutes. Um, uh, today they've been able to deliver close to 30,000 uh, trips in as they deliver blood and medical products across the country. But what you need to understand is Zipline itself is, has been a catalyst to creating a drone economy within Rwanda drone industry that is doing more than just uh, creating a potential impact and value for the healthcare. Mm. Today you have companies that are working with the Ministry of Agriculture and the Ministry of, uh, of Health to, to spray pesticides in some of those mosquito breeding sites. Mm -hmm. And so you reduce um, you know, the, the potential of the spread of malaria. You also have uh, companies that are using drones uh, in the mining sector uh, for mapping. Uh, for example, recently our Minister of Agriculture used drones to map arable land across the entire country. Now, this is an exercise that would inevitably take close to two years or even more than two years. But it took them between two to three months to just map the entire mm. arable land across the entire country. Mm. You, you can't start to imagine the level of efficiencies that have come with just understanding what is the best use case application that is going to create value, but also create the productivity that is needed for the different industries. Mm. Um, very quickly, I wanted to go to where we are at in terms of the next steps. What we're doing now is uh, putting in, we are looking to create a drone operations center. And the idea of creating this is it will look at a whole spectrum of aspects in terms of um, uh, building a thriving drone ecosystem in Rwanda. Looking at the design of drones, looking at the manufacturing of drones, looking at training, that is very important if you're trying to you know, uh, create a thriving and budding industry. What kind of skills are there? Do we have um, you know, startups mushrooming every day mm -hmm. that are able to leverage these technologies to create impact in different um, industries and, and communities? And also giving them the ability to have a test facility where they can test some of these things. Now, all of this as it happens is really going to lead to how do we continuously, because the policies and regulations we have are not necessarily cast in stone. They have to evolve. Yeah. They have to evolve mm -hmm. with the yeah, needs. Sure. They have to evolve with the use case applications. And that's why when you look at the kind of regulations that we have as a country, they are performance best. They focus on what are our concerns as regulators in terms of flying drones. Are there concerns? Are there safety standards that we want to put in place? And you as a drone operator, you, you will provide a proposal that responds to those concerns. Mm -hmm. And that's important to be able to uh, you know, promote innovation and not stifle innovation with having very stringent regulations that don't allow for that flexibility to happen when you are uh, venturing in some of these new okay. emerging technologies. Okay, talk about regulation. Thank you very much. Yes, please. It's, uh, we have the regulation expert here, of course. So, so what's the view of, of IKEA on, on drones regulation? Yeah. <laughs> what, on, on regional harmonization, for instance. So, so many questions uh, could come to mind. Uh, is, is, is IKEA really into this? Does it have a vision? And what is the vision in terms of regulation with regard to, uh, to drones? Thank you. Oh, thank you. Actually, I'll start off with a little bit of background. It was only a small number of years ago that the UAS experts that were coming to ICAO that are actually the individuals who develop the material that becomes the ICAO provisions. So these people are experts from civil aviation authorities, from industry, and from other stakeholder groups. Now, 
for quite a long time, they were coming to ICAO saying, ICAO should absolutely not be involved with small unmanned aircraft. Mm -hmm. That states wanted to handle that subject individually. They did not want to have a harmonization forced upon them from ICAO. Well, more recently that has changed. And that change has been driven by the very, very rapid developments that have occurred around the world that have just been seen by the civil aviation authorities as being overwhelming and by industry who want to be able to operate in a lot of different countries and do so the same way. They need the states to adopt harmonized regulations. So ICAO's had a very light start in this subject. We were working with the framework for larger unmanned aircraft that we call the remotely piloted aircraft since 2007. But getting into the smalls, this, will, this has really just been the last three years or so. And we've struggled a little bit on how best ICAO can support states. What we've been asked for is to essentially develop all regulations that could possibly be needed. Well, you can't do that when something is just in development the industry itself is in development. There are all these pilot projects that are going on around the world. Without those lessons being learned at the local level, we cannot develop a regulatory system that would allow the innovations to occur. So what we're really doing is trying to put together guidance material for the civil aviation authorities on how best to enable operations while considering the safety issues, the security issues, the other related aviation aspects. Now all of this depends on a lot of stakeholders being involved. Aviation as a system involves many different stakeholders. Unmanned aviation, we're now bringing in even more issues related to public health, so ministries of health that we work with in aviation, but not at the same level that we need to in this new arena. And the security experts that are concerned about inappropriate and intentionally bad acts being conducted with unmanned aircraft. And they are right to have concerns over that we need to address those. That's part of the regulatory framework that needs to be developed. But for now, we're really focusing on how to enable regulations or en enable the operations through quite open forms of regulation. But we need those regulations to be adopted in a harmonized manner across states. So it's not just one here and one over there, but all states within a region and then from one region to another region. Harmonization will be key for the industry to be able to thrive. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. So it's a bit of a light touch kind of regulation <laughs> you're aiming for. For now. For now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Let's go to Korea quickly. Uh, I'm, I'm amazed. I, I have been reading uh, articles and, 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 and documents that uh, the government of Korea is investing, injecting $1.2 billion into the drone industry over the next five years. Why are you doing that? Oh, What's the yes. purpose of uh, it? In uh, 2017, the government uh, established a mid-long-term comprehensive plan on drone industry promotion uh, for the next decade, such as like a drone industry promotion and basic plan. And this plan has been fostering the industry in the government level ever since. So being in line with this movement, uh, CAST is making various efforts on our hands 
to welcome an AZ where drones are well assimilated into our daily lives. So our works include like uh, establishment of uh, infrastructure, uh, like a first, like uh, to allow safe drone flight. So we do R&D research on drone, uh, like a Skyway or some K-drone highway establishment. And also we uh, operate uh, those uh, like a drone flight test site. So this support uh, industry development uh, support like a drone uh, startup company uh, by funding and also uh, operating like a support hub uh, for drone business like a health desk and fostering into a future growth industry. So in particular, uh, KIAST has been steadily creating conditions for operation, operator to fly in a convenient manner such as uh, like improving regulation or creating a special flight approval system to allow liberal environment for the, for the drone industry. As a result, we have identified area for institutional improvement in almost 25 like, uh, items or issues in a year, including financial support, for drone industry promotion, and also some aviation business act. And uh, the achievement of policy support is gradually coming in sight. Uh, thanks to this effort, Korea is now in the stage of proposing a personal air vehicle solution. Uh, Hanwha System, one of the big Korea's largest uh, corporation, has on their a uh, massive investment and development plan for PAB uh, development. And also, like Korea's Hyundai Kia Motor Company disclosed its innovative future mobility vision for a human-centered dynamic future city at the International Electronic Fair uh, was held in Las Vegas in last month. CS 2020. The combination of PAB and urban air mobility serves has demonstrated to provide humans with the freedom of seamless movement. So we are moving beyond the simple good delivery and the drone utilization to providing high-level drone service. And the government is preparing for the new era, such as establishing an exclusive department. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's move on quickly to, uh, to uh, our uh, very uh, excited speaker from the <laughs> private sector, Live Blood from uh, Nigeria. So, uh, the government cannot do it alone. There's a lot of uh, uh, excitement and, and drive to do the right policies and the right regulation. It has to come from, from, from the private sector, the, the applications. So, wh what do you see? Uh, are the economics already there for uh, a large-scale, massive drone economy? So how do you see this uh, uh, evolving from your perspective? What is needed and where do you see the opportunities for large-scale private sector involvement in, in the drone economy? Right. So one of the answers, one of the questions, rather, that we had when we were designing this proof of concept that we did in Ethiopia mm. was you know, how much would it cost to actually deliver uh, one unit, you know, to do one trip? You know, what is the cost of it? You know, when you think about the, the, the adware, you know, the software you're gonna need, the, the pilots, you know, everything that goes into actually running a, a proper uh, drone operation. And it's still quite expensive, particularly because one, for the most part, you know, the, the, the distance that the drone can go is not as, you know, particularly the drones that can land and take off. Um, the use case is still not as strong. Being able to deliver multiple um, orders on one trip, it's not there yet. So the, econ the economy of, you know, routine delivery of critical supplies is still quite expensive. Um, 
So we do need, private sector is involved, but there is a need for some sort of subsidization and then innovation. You know, we need to work on the battery, you know, uh, technology. We need to ensure that um, folks are trained because training cost for a good pilot is quite very high because there are not a lot of them. Uh, so we need to make sure that people are trained. A lot of people are trained. There's a critical mass of drone pilots available for, for operators to, to, to employ. Um, you know, there is need for, to look at the manufacturing of the hardware itself. Can it be locally manufa mm -hmm. manufactured? Can we use you know, uh, sustainable materials? Um, are there things we can do to actually bring down the cost of owning a craft, a delivery craft? Uh, so I think that if we're able to do that as a community of you know, drone um, enthusiasts and, and experts mm -hmm. to really bring down the cost of the battery, bring down the cost of the hardware itself, and um, actually not bring out the cost of the battery, but actually make sure the battery can last much longer, mm -hmm. um, and also get a critical mass of trained pilots, I think we're going to see the price crash, and then it will become much more profitable and then does not need subsidization. Because as it is right now, uh, if you're gonna run a state-of-the-art uh, delivery system, particularly for you know, middle income, you know, low income clients, uh, you're gonna need you know, significant subsidization from uh, either the government and public sector or international um, you know, organizations. Yeah. Okay, thank you, thank you. That's a good summary. Thank you very much. I uh, would like to open up for one or two questions from the floor, if, if there are questions. Please feel free to, this is your chance <laughs> to ask pointed questions. Uh, if you have time for that. Uh. We have time for three questions, please. Do we have a mic? So, this is the fun part. George, you point somebody. You point right, yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> hand up, okay. It, it's a lady, I hope. It's not? Ah, no, okay, fine. I'm gender sensitive. Yes, sir. Can we have the mic to him, please? Is it you? It, it's you. All right. So, uh, no. The gentleman behind you was first. Uh, and then I need a lady next. Oh, yeah, we have a lady here. <laughs> and then we need the gentleman from the other side. Okay, please go ahead with the question. Let's start, yeah. We need to move fast, please. And be brief with your question, please. No need for statements, um, just questions. Uh, your name, name and My then... name is Axon Kondwani Mwenda. Okay. So I would like to ask uh, um, the prestigious woman there, uh, Tagiwa, for Life Bank. Uh, is it possible to uh, do a vision in the future whereby you're able to deliver blood, for instance, from Rwanda to Kenya, if a hospital in Rwanda really needs that blood? And uh, uh, how can the private sector make that possible? I understand uh, every country has uh, airspace regulations. So how do you see your company being able to uh, fit in, in the current uh, civil aviation that we have today? Thank you. We'll, have, we'll take the three questions, and then you yeah, can answer you in the, yeah. for the sake of time. Yes, madam. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Diane. I'm the Minister of Health for Rwanda. And I wanted to uh, compliment what our, our Minister of ICT has said. When we started this project, the delivery of uh, blood using drones, even as from the Minister of Health, we were thinking it's a luxury. Nobody understood the impact this project would have on the health sector. But today, from our routine data, we can tell we will, it will have an impact on reducing uh, postpartum hemorrhage cases, and this is the first cause of death in maternal health. And uh, we are undertaking a study to really study the impact vis-a-vis -vis maternal mortality. So I would like to encourage other countries to embrace this technology. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Minister. And the, the audience is very lucky. That was not a question. It was a <laughs> statement of support. So we need two more people. Yes, Madam. Mike, closer to you. This is a question for the Chief Executive. Your name, Mike please. Bank. We didn't get it. Sorry, Katie Prescott from BBC News. Right. Um, I was really interested to hear what you were saying about 
your funding model, and I'd just love to know more about the business model behind Life Bank um, and how you work at the moment. That is for who? Uh, for um, Temi Kiwa. Temi Kiwa. Last question. Tiam, no, 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 not you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Tatenda Mfushka from uh, Scout Area of Zimbabwe. Uh, my question is directed to Ms. Leslie Carey from ICAO. Uh, I wanted to understand what ICAO is doing to empower national aviation authorities to be able to police and uh, develop frameworks to be um, uh, around drone management systems in, in Africa. Thank you. I think we should take this for question, and then we'll see what happens yeah. next. Let's, let's start with uh, Life Bank. So can we deliver inter-country uh, drone delivery <laughs> system? I think that's, that's, a, that's a great question. It's a great, you know, it's actually opened my eyes to what's possible because actually that scenario can be present and is probably present right now where blood is in a different country, it's needed in another country, and can it get to that quickly? I think the one thing that's gonna, you know, make sure that will prevent that from happening is the battery technology. You know, um, particularly if we don't need, if we are not looking to build massive infrastructure for the fixed wing uh, type of drones. Uh, so for me, uh, for us, a life bank, what, what we're looking at is how do we ensure, um, you know the right battery technology that can really power this, um, you know, drones that can take off and land on its own, um, that can do multiple use cases, thus improving profitability. Um, and we are not able to do that right now because of the battery technology. It's simply <laughs> just not there. So what we're looking at and what will make your scenario likely is um, that improvement in, in what batteries can do. And if I might just add, and this is why we have the ADF, and we've got people who are displaying technology that for a drone to stay in the air for six hours, just for your information. Yes, Exciting. go ahead. Exciting. <laughs> I wanted to add on that, um, in the essence, when you look at the Lake Kivu challenge that is happening this week, um, we are looking at about three use cases, find and assess, pick and drop emergency services. And what we're trying to do is to look at t communities between Rwanda and DRC. Now, what does that mean? It means that should we be able to find uh, scalable use cases and models through this challenge, that it also triggers the discussion around cross-border regulations and harmonizing some of these regulations and making sure um, that uh, you know, at a continent level, these regulations and policies are harmonized. Today, you have only 14 countries in Africa that have uh, UAV regulations. That's just a quarter of those. So I think it's a timely uh, discussion to start to think about what happens to the other countries that don't have uh, you know, UAV regulations. How do we get them to, how do we put a standard on, how, on the way we can harmonize these regulations to allow for that inter-country or cross-border? I mean, when you talk about emergency services and you have a landslide, you don't determine where the, land, the effects of the landslide and how far they can be, especially if you, it's around the borders. So in many cases, it may require that we're using drones to go between different jurisdictions but that can only be supported by these harmonized regulations that we can put in place. So yes, to answer your question, it's possible, but it also requires that we look beyond um, simply delivering blood, but what could be the other potential um, you know, applications of where we would need to do cross-border uh, drones uh, flying and really harmonizing those regulations and the standards and making sure that um, everything is put in place to allow for that to happen. Okay, thank you. Let's go to the Ikeo <laughs> question. Well, actually, I wanted to follow up oh. a little more on that one first okay. about the cross-border operations. And then what I'd like to do is highlight when operations are occurring in one state, they have been thoroughly reviewed and assessed by the Civil Aviation Authority within that state. So here in Rwanda, there are specific routes 
specific procedures that have been approved for the drones to operate in airspace. And the air traffic controllers are notified and monitor what is happening. Pilots of other aircraft are informed of what is happening. So in order to do cross-border operations, not only do both countries have to be part of that review process, setting up specific routes and procedures and how coordination will be effected. So it's actually a very complicated process within one state alone. Adding a second state to it is something that we absolutely need to be able to get to, but it is going to be a very complicated process and it will require that each of the states have harmonized regulations. Mm, so it's yeah. going to keep coming Absolutely. back to that harmonization. Mm. But we need to get there. We absolutely need to get there. Now, in terms of the question specifically about what ICAO is doing to help the national aviation authorities, I did not catch all of the question, unfortunately. But what I will say is that Part of the mandate from ICAO is to share the best practices. So whether it is an event like this organized through the World Bank and the Rwandan CAA, or it's an ICAO organized symposium, and we do organize annual symposia on UAS, where we are looking at the different developments the new technologies that are needed, how to solve specific problems, and bringing experts together, including the civil aviation authorities, to learn from each other and to help shape the development and research that needs to be done to bring about the long-term solutions. So we're doing what we can within our relatively limited abilities. Here across Africa, we have our regional offices that do a lot of work directly with the states, which from my KO headquarters in Montreal, we rarely get to get out and see what's going on specifically. But from the regional offices, they do have those direct contacts with the national aviation authorities and Again, it really comes back to the sharing of information. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Debbie, you want to add something to the BBC question on the business model? Right. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I, the, the business model is to charge, um, you know, a, to the business model at its core is a cross-subsidization system where, you know, certain hospitals will, uh, you know, delivering care to um, you know, the upper quantile of the economy uh, pay a lot more, and that then subsidizes smaller hospitals. Uh, on average, you know, we charge about $10 for, for, for every unit we deliver, um, and that allows us to build sustainability, but also um, fulfills our we feel more our responsibility to make sure that what we're charging is, is acceptable for most people. Because what we really want is universal access to care. And if, you know, in, in, some, in some of the places where we operate, there is no public payer. So we then have to people paying, you know, a significant chunk of healthcare spending is out of pocket. So people are paying out of pocket. So we have a responsibility to ensure that we're charging them something they can afford. So we've built a cross subsidization system uh, that averages out to about ten dollars um, that really delivers universal, constant, twenty four hours a day, seven days a week, uh, critical supplies, blood, oxygen, blood products. Um, to all the hospitals in, in the communities where we work. Okay, thank you. Um, Any more questions? Or? Yes, uh, I find this discussion very interesting, exhilarating. So, uh, can we have uh, three more questions? Okay, we'll start over there. Yes, sir. Can we get a mic for him, please?
Uh, thank you. My name is Patrick Manzi. My question goes directly to Honorable Minister of ICT, Paula Ingabile. So, Minister, I just want to ask you this. What is the pipeline for a youth like me who want to develop a career in aviation? Do you have something in the pipeline? What are you planning for us? Thank you. Okay. Second question. Yes, sir. Unfortunately, the mics are not being brought to you by drone, you know, so it's feet, you know, so, but anyway, we'll get there. <laughs> Thank you very much. My name is Michael and I'm working for UNICEF. And as you may know, we just uh, kicked off the African Drone and Data Academy in Malawi. And the word training was mentioned more than once and every time it got uh, repeated, got more excited. And I wanted to ask the honorable um, panelists on what your vision is when it comes to training. And, how to move forward because as you rightfully um, pointed out in order to scale we need trained pilots we need people well not only pilots but technicians and people who can harvest data and many more things so what's the african vision when it comes to training thank you then we need a lady now do we have a lady no no i'm looking for a lady I, I, I'll, I'll get to you <laughs> Is that a lady? I mean, if it's a lady, keep on. Yes, so okay. <laughs> Give the mic if it's a lady only. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much. I am by the names of Mungali Kerry from the Marinindo Girls School. And my question goes directly to the Honorable Minister of ICT and Innovation Rwanda. <laughs> About the operation of the drone center, I was wondering who is able to join and how will it take for one to, to get, for using drones in his or her project? And another question says, what expectations from this African Drone Forum or the, establish, the establishment of the drones in Rwanda? Thank you. Wow. All right, thank the you. future with innovative yeah. minds that are there. Over to you, panelists. <laughs> <laughs> Honorable Minister, I think thank it's you. all for you. <laughs> Thank you. I'll start with the first question, which was really around the pipeline for someone who's, uh, who intends to pursue a career in aviation. When you, when you um, there, without going into details talk, of uh, the current education pipeline around some of the uh, programs, whether it's at university level, around um, you know, particular bachelor's degrees um, in aerospace engineering, which are all available, there is, when I mentioned the Drone Operations Center, one of the aspects that I did mention was around uh, training. And um, what we have today currently, even before we set up the Drone Operations Center, for example, at the University of Rwanda, the College of Science and Technology, you have a center of excellence um, that has you know, young people like yourselves that are coming in to design uh, drones and learn how to fly them, look at different uh, uh, use cases, but also to test them. And that's a space where many, uh, you know, many students, not just for the University of Rwanda that are studying there, can come and learn uh, some of these skills, but also test, um, you know, what they're building. And so that's already an available opportunity that you can explore. Uh, but with the drone um, operation center that is coming in place and the training academy that is a huge component of it, there will be more opportunities to take on uh, more students and more young people that are really looking. And maybe I shouldn't say young people, anyone, any age that is looking to um, you know, um, test and build and design drones, but also do it in a way that they are commercially scalable and they'll create value and impact for you. Then uh, the other thing, uh, the second question was around training. I know the other panelists will also touch on that. For you to build a new emerging uh, industry, it's always important to start with the skills because the skills will make or break the industry. We may have the facilities, whether it's the testing and training center, the test centers, and also today we have the Fab Lab, uh, which is uh, just a few minutes away from this convention center, maybe 10 minutes walking, depending on how fast you can walk. But what you have there is they are teaching people how to uh, design and fabricate uh, some of these uh, drones that, 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 uh, that are being used. So that's already um, really 
uh, a platform where we're looking to say how do we expose and build the right capabilities for our, uh, our youth and our young people that are really looking to learn how to use drones but also to transform that into a commercial uh, uh, business that is going to create value for them. And so training can never be overemphasized because it's easy to just put the facilities that we need. It's easy for us as government to say, here are some of the challenges that we think there's a good potential for drones to respond to, whether we're talking about increasing agricultural productivity, whether we're talking about emergency delivery, whether we're talking about mining, opportunities in mining, or even opportunities um, around healthcare and uh, surveillance. But at the end of the day, it's going to boil down on the skills of, that people can use to be able to tap into those opportunities. And that's why training really comes uh, as a first uh, step for investment uh, that we need to collectively, whether it's the industry and government, uh, put together efforts to make sure that we are training an army of uh, drone operators, an army of drone uh, developers and designers that can create real world um, solutions. Um, the last question was around the drone operation center, how it can be, you know, how one can join and, um, and how they can be used. I earlier talked about the center of excellence at the University of Rwanda, where we have uh, many people that are exploring the potential use cases around uh, drones and unmanned aerial vehicles. This is already an opportunity that exists and, and you have, anyone can come in and, and, you know, use these facilities, but also be trained on how to use them. When it comes to the Drone Operations Center, right now we finished doing the feasibility study, the design studies have been done, and we're now um, uh, working towards putting in place this uh, infrastructure in place. And once it's up and running, in the process of making sure it's operational, we'll be putting out different criteria for people that are really looking to come and join in and be part of the training, but more than just being part of the training, to also think about developing some of these uh, uh, use case applications that we've been talking about. And so over time, as we uh, set up this uh, drone operation center, we'll be uh, also putting up the different criteria, which I believe will be uh, easy enough for anyone that is willing and able to join um, this center. OK, thank you. I think we're coming to a close here. Uh, just one, one question for each panel, panel member. So just give me one shout or one phrase or one sentence. What's your dream for a drone economy in your context? What would you see, would you, would you like to see happen in, in your context as a, as a dream, as a vision for the next five years? Where should it go? On his way. What is your vision? Tell me. So what we'd like to see is okay. to see a thriving uh, drone it. economy in Rwanda. But one where we, again, like I said, the idea for us as a tech hub is to be a proof of concept hub where we can scale solutions beyond Rwanda. So that is what we want to see, to see all these solutions that we're talking about scaling beyond Rwanda, not just creating impact in Rwanda.